Hey, but this is like having another trans girl CNC where we talk about comics, cartoons, and other awesome nerd shit. So, um, it's the main video, and before we get into our main topic, which as you can tell by my shirt is something Avatar related, the title's Avatar related, so that's why you clicked on the video, probably unless you just like me, which if you like me, looks pretty sweet. But before we get into it, let's talk about a thing you might have missed. This is, of course, a segment where I suggest something to you that you might have overlooked for whatever reason, and I think that you could still like it. I'm suggesting to you this week, Fence from Boombox Studios. It's a comic about fencing, which, you know, if you're not into sports, that's totally fine. I'm not either. This is like suggesting a sports anime, in my opinion. Now I kind of want to actually go watch Haikyuu because of this particular comic. It's totally two different sports, but now I kind of get what people are talking about. Fence is about fencing. It's a fencing comic. It's a story about Jonathan Cox. What a terrible fucking name. But uh, it's a story about him, and he's basically like a guy who's an outsider to the fencing world. Like, this is, could totally just be an anime. Not sure why it isn't, but you could... He's the outsider, and he's coming in, and he's like, I, you know, I'm good, I'm not bad at, you know, this, and whatever, I'm going to be the best. And he gets basically set up in his first round at a tournament against, like, the top-tier guy named Seji, who has, or, yeah, Seji, who's been, like, competing all over. He, like, competed in Europe or whatever. There are rumors of him going to an elite, prestigious fencing school next year. Like, like, this is the guy. What do we call it? I don't know. And he's like, hey, I right, hear Jonathan's like, hey, here you're like the guy to beat. Well, I'm going to do it. And they fence and he loses because of course. It's, you know, it'd be kind of interesting if he had won or it would have been really shown in if he had won. But yeah, so not a big deal. Anyway, next day he actually shows up to his new school and it's an all boys school with dormitories and stuff. And it turns out that Sedge is his roommate, so get ready for wacky hijinks. Uh, Fence only has three issues currently, so you can definitely catch up pretty quickly. Uh, the art's fantastic, and if I'm not mistaken, I'm picking up a lot of queer, queer vibes from the two boyos. So, we'll see how that goes, but let's get into our main topic. I'm super excited for this. It's Legend of Korra Turf Wars Part Two. Now, of course, I reviewed the very first part of this, part one, which is on this channel. Uh, you can look for it by the same title name. We'll just have part one in front of it instead of part two. Um, the two videos aren't necessarily connected, but, you know, it wouldn't hurt if you go watch the first one. Now, I am going to get into some of the technical things about the comic as far as, you know, like art and storyboarding go. Um, but at some point, I'm going to start talking about the actual story. And on that point, it's all spoilers. So, that's just what that is. Uh, if you don't want to be spoiled, if you want to read this yourself, it can be picked up at any comic book shop. It can be picked up in Barnes & Noble, Borders. Does Borders exist? I don't know. Look, the point is, if there's a place where you go and you get your graphic novels, your manga, your comics, they have it. Go get it. Go pick it up. Pick up part one, too. Like, seriously. Read this. It's good. Uh, so let's talk about just some of the technical things now. The cover's pretty great. If you haven't actually seen the artwork for these books before, um, definitely you should be watching part one of uh, my review. But, uh, yeah, it's like really surprising, especially if you're used to the Avatar Last Airbender comics over the Legend of Korra comics. Uh, it's a different artist, Irene Ko. She has amazing work. Her lines are not only really clear, but they're sketchy in places which I think adds an entire layer to the actual storytelling of the comic. It's just like, it's, it's raw, it's got more rawness to it. Like, I don't know if I'm using, yeah, totally using that right. Uh, it's just got like uh, this gritty kind of feel to it, which brings out the more uh, dark aspects of the story in general. Uh, the storyboarding is really good. The pacing is, well, it's like the all Avatar comics come in three. So, you know, it's the middle part of the story. We've already had the beginning. Now we're kind of ramping up to the climax, and this is the middle point. So the, the pacing's not bad. 
uh, I mean, I'm not meaning to make it sound like the pacing's bad or anything. It's just, you know, it's the middle part of the story. And I feel that all the uh, Avatar comics previously to this, uh, with Aang, also had kind of the same middle storytelling in, in the middle. That's where the middle storytelling happens. But let's, but it's not, it's not, like I said, it's not bad. It's really good. I really love this. So let's actually get into the story. As mentioned, we're just kind of, you're pretty much lucky I'm telling you again that we're going to get into some spoilery territory here. And, yeah. But, I guess before we get into that, uh, I love the art, I love the colors, I love the story, obviously, and I love the characters. The, the really, everything is hitting on all cylinders for me personally, and I would say you'd be remiss to miss this series out of any kind of prejudices you might have had for Legend of Korra, like give it another another go. A lot of people are still angry about the ending of the show and how it happened, and they're ridiculous. A lot of people miss the point in Korra's development, and I don't know. I think that it needs to be watched through at least one more time if you really didn't like it. Like I don't want to say force yourself, but I think you miss some points and some some parts of the story which really helped develop Korra as, like, her own person, rather than, oh, she... Like, anyway, let's not get into that, because that's a completely different video for another time. Let's get into this. So, at the end of Turf Wars 1, we had a big fight between the Avatar, the Air Nomads, the Avatar and the Air Nomads fighting against a triple threat triad. And the spirits came in and, like, messed things up. Basically, the new leader of the Triple Threat got, like, he, a spear went through him, and if you watch the Wan episodes in Season 2 of Legend of Korra, you know what that kind of does to people, or especially if you've read this book. Uh, it makes them kind of like these spirit creature amalgamations, and that's totally happening to him, and he blames the Avatar, he thinks, like, the spirits, like, were attacking on her orders, and rather than... I'm just doing themselves, and that's kind of where everything picks up from, because, you know, of course it does. It's a continuation of the story, not like a, you know, time skip. Three months later, no. So, not three months later, right away. Uh, Korra, Tenzin, the Air Kids, and two other Air Acolytes, Kai and Glasses Guy, <laughs> I don't know what his name is. Uh, he was the shut-in. Um, they go to the spirit world because they want to talk to the spirits like, hey, you know, humanity is not bad. We just here to reassure you. And when they get there, uh, what was a giant, like, lush field of flowers is all, like, rotted and dead. It's kind of like a message to humans, like, stay the fuck out of the spirit world. It's not your place. Like, they even get, like, attacked by these things. And that's, like, a really interesting part that the spirits left behind these traps for, you know, wandering humans. So they leave the spirit world, like it happened really quickly, and the United Kingdom forces are circling the portal, they're like building walls, and they're like, we're here to like, you know, keep people out of the spirit world, keep spirits out of the human world. That's our whole thing. Korra's like, no, that's not what we want. You know, we just want peace, balance, and harmony. And it's Iroh who's, you know, leading this whole thing, Iroh too. And he's like, well, I got my orders from President Raiko, and if you don't like them, you're going to have to talk to him, because he is my boss. So this leads us to Iroh. Iroh, I'm not sorry, not Iroh, this leads us to Raiko. So Asami and Zuli are building homes for the people who have been kind of pushed out of their homes by the creation of the new portal, which is, of course, not really anybody's fault, Korra saved the entire city at the cost of, like, several square blocks. And opened a new spirit portal, so there's nothing anybody can do about that. People want Por Korra to close the portal. She doesn't even know if she can do that, one. Two, she doesn't even want to because she wants it to be seen as a symbol of balance, that the spirit world and the human wor world should be, as it once was, able to intermingle mingle with each other. Intermingle. <laughs> like, and I get that. I understand that point. I can also understand the point of people are like, hey, just close this so that we can, like, freaking, 
you know, move on with our lives. We don't need this. Spirits want it closed. Humans want it closed. But Korra's like, I don't know if I can do that, and I don't want to do that. Which is part of her stubborn streak, you know. Which is fine. It's fine to have a character with flaws, especially if they're pretty decent flaws that can be explored and edged out. And as mentioned, she doesn't even know if she can close the portal. And nobody's going to force her to do it. It's mentioned all times that nobody can force her to do it. So we get to Asami and Suli building homes. President Raiko and his guy, who's like his campaign manager, come up with like a bunch of refugees and like, here, see, take a look at these awesome homes that we're building for you. And we'll have them done by the end of the month. And Asami and Zulia are like, that's a promise you're making that you might not be able to keep. Uh, we're moving along as fast as we can, and we're looking at, like, a month to two months before people can move in, you know, because we want everything to be structurally sound and good. We don't want to make, like, shoddy, shitty homes for people and have them move in. Uh, meanwhile, Raiko is like, no, no, it's totally cool. That's when Cora shows up, and she's like, hey, get the allied forces away from the portal. And Raiko blames the entire situation on Cora. It's not a good look for her. It's not a good situation for her to be in. Raiko is a shitty human being. Uh, let's, that's all I really want to talk to you about Raiko, because that's not, like, the point of the story. Like, he's, like, a footnote in the story. He's just, like, one small problem on top of a heap of problems that Korra's going to go through in the story. So, <sighs> goodness, just, like, a lot of, like, stuff. Raw. Anyway, everybody tells Asami that she should, not Asami, Zuli, that she should run for, you know, pr president of the city, because everybody would love her. And, I mean, it's, a Z it's Zuli. Of course everybody would love her. Why wouldn't they? So, sorry. Sorry. Um, why wouldn't they love her? Got the track. And so she goes back and forth, like, should I, shouldn't I? Varric says that she should, and she's like, yeah, I'd be totally great at this. I really like that Varric is so supportive of Zoo Julie, just because uh, when we first meet the two, he's, like, ordering her around, making crazy requests. Of course, she's fulfilling these. And, like, he is just, like, er everything that she wants to do, he is, like, 150% about it. He's like, yep. You're going to be president. I'm going to fund your campaign. I'm going to get you out there. You're going to beat the pants off, Raiko. You got this, baby girl. I you know, I love you. I love everything you're doing and everything about you. And, you know, you feel, if this is what you want, you do it because you're going to be amazing at it. And that's just such a good relationship. Like, it's a, you know, it came from craziness, but it's so just, like, pure and good, and I love it. It's my second favorite relationship in the series. Uh, Sami and Korra are... Having not necessarily relationship issues, they're just feeling the stresses of what's going on, and it's kind of causing a little bit of tension. There is, there are a couple points where uh, Korra misunderstands what Asami says, and there's like a little bit of a squabble about it, but they make up super fast because Korra realizes, hey, that's not what Asami meant when she said that. So that's that's on me for misunderstanding, and Asami's like, no, I should even know word it, but anyway. It, it works out really, really good. And so they make a dinner date, and I can't, you know what I mean? I can't wait for that dinner date to happen. I'm, like, turning pages, reading, of course. But I'm like, come on, let's just get to the dinner date. Let's get to, like, some good, fluffy, fluff stuff. And we get to the dinner date, and it's just Korra sitting there. And then it looks like Asami's not showing, which is like, ah, oh, tension. I don't like it. But she calls up Mako and Bola, and like, hey... Asami wouldn't stand me up, so I think something happened at her office. Let's go. And something did happen. Mm. And that's why she didn't show up. It turns out that the leader of the Triple Threats had one of his henchmen grab Asami, and now he's using her as a bargaining chip to keep Korra at bay. Meanwhile, he's using a different person who wanted to use the spirit world as, like, a tourist trap. He's using him because he's a high-profile uh, guy, to, like, keep the police at bay, like, hey, I'll kill these two people if you do not back the F off. He's the um, villain whose name I'm just totally blanking on, which is one of the reasons I was kind of in there. Um, he's like, yeah, the spirit thing fucking sucks, but I fucking, like, I'm getting it now, and I have great ideas, 
you know, there's a bunch of Kuvira's old equipment, you know, tanks and mechs just sitting around waiting for somebody to use them. That somebody might as well be us, and that's what he does. And so the book ends with uh, him rolling tanks and mechs toward the public city. Uh, he's got a Sami hostage with a fire dagger to her neck by one of his henchmen. And so there's nothing Korra can do. I mean, this, like I said, this is a cliffhanger that's like really super frustrating that's a cliffhanger because I want to see what's going to happen. But, you know, we'll see. And so that's where it ends. And so what a cliffhanger. It gets you like so excited to see, see uh, part three of the story because you know uh, things are just going to go crazy. Now, I'm worried something bad's going to happen to Asami. Just because, I don't know, because Legend of Korra is such a much more serious story. I mean, when you think about the season finale of Book 4 and how many people actually died in that, like, it's, you can feel a little, like, I feel fear. I feel fear. Um, some other things about the book, there's, they keep bringing up Mako's, or they keep mentioning it, Mako's discomfort in Asami and Korra's relationship which I don't like, fine. Like, and he's like, oh, no, I'm not, you know, bothered by it, but it, he obviously is. Like, Bolin puts in the report to Chief Bay Fun that uh, Asami and Korra kiss because, you know, it's a police report. you got to mark everything down. And <sighs> Mako's like, I told you to write a report, not a romance novel. Like, that's such a weird thing. He could say, like, that part of the report is completely unnecessary, but he had to word it like that. So I really hope he... Like, gets over whatever's bothering him. I'm sure it's, like, weird to watch your exes date. In fact, I've had exes date each other, so it is weird. But, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see where that goes. Hmm. Thirsty from talking. So, that's it. That's the video. Because, of course, it is. Oh, you can that. And uh, I'll see you, you know, if you're only on YouTube with me, I'll see you... You know, later in the week for our midweek video. Don't know what we're talking about. But if you subscribe to me, or if you watch me on Breach TV, I'm going to be doing a special... Oh, no, I can't do that. Darn, I need YouTube to upload. Never mind, I'll see you all uh, tomorrow. I'm doing a special extra video about the anime awards, who I'm voting for. Maybe not necessarily why. We'll see how it goes, time constraints, etc. I'm going to go through each category and tell you my opinions about who I think should win it at the very least. And yeah, we'll, we'll see how that does. Anyway, I'm Fire Princess Celine. Until tomorrow, <laughs> enjoy comics, enjoy cartoons, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.